Coming up next on Headline Humboldt, we sit down with Donna Clark and Gerald Lynn Rubin from American Field Service, an educational organization set up to help high school students visit other countries to study. Also, contributor Eric Black reports on Humboldt County's decision this week to permit a major new development on the Samoa Peninsula, one that could bring scores of jobs to the capital-strapped region. Coming up now on Headline Humboldt. From the top of Humboldt Hill, this is Headline Humboldt. I'm James Falk. Thanks for joining us. One of the best things an individual can do, in my opinion, to broaden their mind and literally expand their horizons is to travel. Any travel is good. Even stepping off your porch and heading for a few hours down the highway can do wonders to alter one's perspective and make you aware that your little corner of the world is just that, one point of view in a wide open universe. But traveling internationally, crossing borders and dipping into foreign cultures that have different values and an exotic way of life is perhaps the best thing someone can do to really get an understanding of what's really human nature and what's just the cultural window dressing we've all learned not to see. For a teenager especially, getting the opportunity to live abroad, immersing yourself in another culture, adopting that language, and ultimately understanding how individual identity can shift against the background of broader society, this can prevent them from ever falling victim to the kind of colloquial ignorance that pervades so much of American society today, American society and all society, frankly. Hence our show tonight. We sit down with two folks from American Field Service, an educational group working to help high school students travel overseas and cross international borders to study. And in the process, American Field Service can help to craft kids into world citizens that better recognize how everyone everywhere shares so much more in common than they've ever realized. And so the interview, host mother Donna Clark and Gerald Lynn Rubin, diversity and inclusion coordinator, associate support coordinator, and post-arrival orientation coordinator. That's a lot of titles, so thank you for joining us, taking time out of your busy schedule. But uh, you guys have been involved with American Field Service for uh, at least the last year, but let's um, first talk about, Gerald, you've been involved with the program for, you said, a dozen years? Yeah. Uh, how did you first get started? I don't remember how I started, but when my children were leaving home, I just was uh, going to miss the vitality and the connection, so I started hosting, and over the years I have had different roles. One is hosting student for either half a year or a year. Another is liaison where we, every student in Humboldt who comes to their family has a liaison, which is a fabulous role, mm -hmm. where you get to know the student really well, get to know the family, and if anything's difficult, you hear both sides and you facilitate communication. And there's a training you go through about cultural issues and you learn the culture in the country and what might come up. Sometimes it's about food, sometimes how much they talk on their device to friends back home, sometimes it's misinterpreting, um, communication, uh, facial expressions, et cetera. So yeah. I've done that. I'm also the diversity coordinator because initially uh, when I was interested in hosting, uh, LGBT families were not permitted because wow. they didn't think they would, they thought some countries would be alienated, but now it's shifted. So if you apply to AFS, you get the family you get. You're not allowed, you just commit you're not allowed to have any discrimination on race or um, gender sexual preference. Well, good, I think that's a positive development. Yeah. Now, Donna, you mentioned that you did it last year and you had a young Thai girl um, in your home. What was her name again? Her name was <laughs> Giti Akorn Patiwang, but and she went by Kunain. Kunain is her nickname, right? Yes, all Thai people have short nicknames because their names are so long. Yeah, um, and beautiful. It's a beautiful yes, name. Yes, absolutely beautiful. Um, Now, so you did that last year for the first time. Uh, how was your experience? Would you, at the end of it, I mean, if this is, uh, you know, um, an internet review, what would your uh, tagline be? <laughs> Oh, it was a wonderful experience. My husband and I really enjoyed. We don't have children of our own, so it was really fun having a, an instant daughter. She called us mom and dad. Uh -huh. That was a surprise to us, but she was so warm and, and loved her experience here. She had a great time with us, with Eureka High School, and most of all, our cats. <laughs> and you said that she was a very successful student uh, also. Yes, um, yes. She's, uh, many AFS students are very, very driven, and um, she was a straight-A student. Yeah. So despite the, the language, she did very, very well. Now, you, me you mentioned earlier in our conversation that uh, you're going to talk to her soon. So this wasn't like she comes into your house, she stays for a while, and you're never going to talk to her again. No, There's a relationship there. Absolutely. And I think that's one thing that many people who have hosted before realize that they 
have a, a lifelong relationship. So her parents have already invited us to go to Thailand. They have a house picked up for us wow. and everything. So, um, yes, I suspect that uh, Kunain is mine for life. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a good story. Um, so, but in particular, what we're doing the show for today is that there are seven hopeful students who need a home, apparently. That's um, correct. There are eight students who've been approved already, and they're yes. all female. So we have seven boys who would like to come to the United States and study, and um, but they need a house and a home to do it. And so they're seeking volunteers from folks who could um, do that. So we have uh, Abdul Rahman, is that right? From Tanzania, he's 16 years old. Abdul Rahman and his friends enjoy studying for their courses together, playing their favorite games together, talking about history and various cultures, and they love the beauty of nature. I think Humboldt County would be a good fit exactly. for him. Um, <laughs> Pudis or Pudis um, is a 15 year old boy from Thailand. Leo has a twin sister and a younger brother. He's very close with his family and he wants to be a filmmaker. Um, and Mufaniso, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, it's M-F-O-N-I-S-O -S from Nigeria, he's 15. He loves watching scientific documentaries, listening to music, watching great movies, reading novels, dancing, playing musical instruments, and socializing. He's also studying biology, chemistry, English, and physics. He wants to be a doctor. Easy guy. Wow. My own kids need to, like, get to work. <laughs> I'm a little uh, offended here. <laughs> Meet Tiago from Argentina. Um, reading is Tiago's passion. He... Uh, uh, entertains, amuses, and nurtures his mind, reading does. He plays rugby to stay in shape and practices teamwork and discipline while playing rugby. There's Elijah from Ghana. Uh, he's the eldest boy in the family of five. He's a responsible and caring young man who helps his mother prepare Sobolo, a local drink made from a vegetable plant with some spices and sugar. He helps to study the computer world and learn more uh, enhancing technologies to profit his community. Uh, wow, that's from Ghana. And then Tomoyuki from Japan, 16 years old, is very athletic. At home, he willingly shares the chores with his family and loves taking his lovely golden retriever for walks. He also loves Marvel movies and Star Wars. And then meet Abdi from Kenya. He describes himself as energetic, happy, and loving. And he likes to do many things, especially read, swim, and visit with relatives. He's big into chess, him and his friends, and they enjoy playing against one another. So those are seven impressive kids. Yes. Right. And if anybody listening is interested, we'll tell you how to get yeah, these kids. Yeah, so there's a number, right? 822-1111. If you forget that, I don't know what to tell you, but it's 822-1111. You can call and say, I'm interested in being a host for some of the kids I heard about in the Headline Humboldt, or however you want to put it, and they will put you in contact with the process, and you can apply and look through the, the profiles of these kids and start um, that. You can also volunteer to be a liaison. Right, correct. Which is an interesting role to me. It sounds like you have to kind of balance their cultural needs versus, you know. And so if you don't have room in your home, but you really want to get involved, it's a lovely position to be in because you get to spend time with the international student and um, meet this family and make new friends. And it also is a rewarding experience. Yeah. So that's another way you can get involved in this wonderful program, AFS. Yeah. I wondered what AFS meant when I first started American Field Service. What an unusual name. Well, it yeah. turned out this um, was uh, the um, ambulance drivers in World War I. At the end of the war, they were so horrified by what they'd seen, they wanted to know, was there a way that they could promote peace in the world instead of war? And they came up with this idea of exchange, and that's the inception of AFS. You should have led with that. Uh, I'm a big Hemingway fan, so uh, <laughs> that's amazing. That's a great story. So that is the yeah. story behind AFS. Cool. Now, you guys also send American students elsewhere, right? Yes. And, uh, and there's, you can go for, there's different lengths you can go for a year, like these mm -hmm. students go, or there's, in the summer, there's shorter and longer programs, and that same number. 8221111 will Susan's Susan is one of the coordinators and she'll give you the information on so that. So you can apply you can start to figure out the process for applying by doing that. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, Geraldine, let's what do you think is the most valuable thing for a student whether they're coming here or they're going somewhere else? What is the most valuable part of the experience for, for them? Well, you know, when you're rooted out of your own environment, you have to adapt and adjust. You really get to know yourself better. You get to know what's you and what's 
your parents pressuring, your parental expectations, your peers' expectations. I, I think identity formation happens for the student. And then when they get back to their own culture, they always see their own culture with different eyes. They don't sure. take anything for granted. It's all fresh and new. Yeah. And also adopt adaptation, resiliency, all these new experiences, and you don't have your, you're taking a teenager out of their peer group. Yeah. And they have to reach out, make new friends, where all the, in a different language usually, either way you're going, it's, it's just a huge growthful thing. And these kids are 15, 16, 17. Yeah, yeah. That's young. Well, and it's like they're forced to adapt. They're suddenly on their own. I mean, and they can't even eloquently speak the language, so they're really forced to like go internalize and then figure out how to cope in a strange new environment, which, while painful, I think can lead to tons of growth, you know? I mean, uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a very rewarding experience. Yeah, so now, um, how, how would you say that your student last year described it? Uh, she was thrilled. She was so happy. Um, she didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. and, and she wanted to pack one of my cats in her suitcase. <laughs> but she knew she couldn't. So yeah. we still, we uh, message each other so she can still see us. Yeah. And like I said, I know that she will, she, this will be something that she'll remember for the rest of her life. She was really proud of herself because um, she actually got a high school diploma, which is unusual. She worked wow. really hard yeah. and actually got an official California high school diploma. So now how did this work with, this was post-COVID, right? Did you guys have to shut down during the COVID era? Or? Um, yeah, yes. we had a year where we didn't have students. Yeah, yeah. Like and that's why else, we right? bought a small group over it was summer. I hosted a student for a week from Sulawesi, mm -hmm. Indonesia. Wow. So that was really fun. Now we talked a little bit about your history with the program. You seem to have the perfect resume for someone who would want to do this. Can we go over that history a little bit? You've, oh, you've yeah. an educator for one thing, right? Yes, uh huh. I graduated from Humboldt, and it's various many names. Yeah, but, right. And, the Teachers College to Cal yeah, Poly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I went abroad in the Peace Corps. I was in Peace Corps Malaysia. I came back. I got my teaching credential. I worked as an English as a second language teacher. I taught for second grade. I taught um, high school ESL. And then I got a job at Humboldt mm -hmm. and worked there for the last half of my career. And in that job, I also interacted with international students there. I was the staff advisor for the Global Connections Club. Yeah, yeah. And so that's <laughs> Ideally situated as an ESL teacher, too. And, and that's actually how I met, started meeting AFS program because they asked if some of the high school AFS could come to the Global Connections Club, which of course that was wonderful. Yeah. So that's how I first um, became aware of AFS okay. was while I was working at Humboldt. So what would you say, Geraldine, is the ideal family to take in kids like this? I mean, is there a profile you're looking for or can it be wide and varied as you know people? It's are? really varied. It's just it, it just if you have children the kids have to really want it mm -hmm. because the young kids, the teenage kids, it's really going to change their family dynamic. Yeah, sure. So they will not take a family if the kids don't want it. Okay. That's the most important thing. What kind of review can someone look forward to if they say, yeah, I'm interested in doing that? How much uh, are, should they be prepared to let people you know, come in and look around? You have to, the house has to be ready for them. You, can, you have to have a bedroom for them. They can share with the same gender. You have to really talk about your family's rules and expectations mm -hmm. and how you're going to handle chores. You really have to think, what it did for me when I hosted the first time, I had to think about the culture of my family. Yeah. What was expected of the kids? What did I do if they did or didn't do? How much communication I expected? How was your day in school? Okay, or are you supposed to tell me? You really have to look at your family as its own culture. So that was a valuable experience. Yeah, well, I was gonna say, that's a, that sounds like a learning experience for the host families as oh, yeah. well as for the kids. I mean, you all have to figure out how to work well together, you know? But what I realize is that you don't have to be a perfect family. Right. You don't have to have Martha Stewart house. <laughs> um, I, that was one thing that kind of worried me a little sure, bit. Sure, yeah, but of course. Gee, um, I've got stuff stashed in this closet in the bedroom. Is that going to be okay? Yes, it was fine. Yeah. Um, you don't need the perfect family. You don't need the perfect partner. You don't need the perfect relationship. You just to be who you are. Yeah, and be authentic and caring, right? I mean, exactly. For these kids. And um, you know, I, I so I, that was what worried me was, you know, gee, this isn't a perfect house. And yeah. they just laughed at me and said, you're fine. <laughs> the only thing you can't have is you can't have a futon bed. You have to have a real bed okay. for some reason. 
that well, was an I, issue. I think it makes sense. You want but, <laughs> it's a permanent you know, piece yeah. of furniture. I had so, a comment on a different topic. Sure. Some of the students on this list, and some of the ones who come are in a particular scholarship program. I just want to impress people that um, it's called the YES program, Youth Educational Services. Mm -hmm. And from some of these countries that have a majority Muslim population, mm -hmm. they're in a competitive situation where to come, it's about 100 to 1. 1 to 100 gets selected. They have to wow. do essays. They have to have language tests. They have to have role play where they answer questions about their country. And then at the top of it is one. So the two people I... So they get a slot, basically. Yes, like I was involved with the Jessica last year from Mozambique was in that program and also mm -hmm. Namta. And she was from Pakistan. And they had gone through that whole process. And then they are required to do volunteer work. So they both worked at the thrift store in Arcata. They went along the trails and picked up uh, stuff on the trails that I've never even done since I lived there. They volunteered yeah. to serve at various community functions. So the students on that program not only compete to get here, have to do volunteer work here, and when they get home, they have to do volunteer work to wow. make their country a better place. And so you're getting creme de la creme in some yeah. of the those students. I mean, all the students are great, yeah, but that, yeah, that's an additional subcategory. Yeah, like and it gives year, you a sense yeah. of how much these kids want this. I mean, yeah, they, they, go they work that. hard. And their family oh, is just rooting for them to get a family. They can't come without a family. Yeah. That's amazing. They really want it so badly. One of the things I noticed is that this is more representational of the world than you typically see in these kinds of programs. Like, usually you'll have, no offense to Swedes or, you know, Norwegians, but you'll have people from Western Europe or cultures yes. that we're more comfortable with because they're, they're more Western. Um, and this isn't like that. Is that on purpose? Or? Yeah, that's probably because of this program. Okay. Because the program is, our State Department after 9-11 wanted to have more understanding of Muslim cultures. And they found, this is called, like, popular demo, um, diplomacy or soft diplomacy, a word for the kind of diplomacy where it's people to people, and they're actually funding it. Excellent. Excellent. Our, our government's funding it. Yeah, cool. and there's actually, there was another one because after the war, there's oh, yeah. a German brace program too, mm -hmm. where we get students from Germany because of course after the war, there was a lot of concern yeah, about absolutely. that too. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, so there's a, another, pro is that FLEX is the German? Yes, yes. FLEX mm -hmm. is the German based program. Wow. So we have a minute left. Uh, I told you it would go fast, uh, but uh -huh. is there anything that I missed that you guys would like to mention? We got the kids in there, 822-1111. There's also a website which was... AFS.org slash hosting. Okay, you know, and there's just, a bunch of stuff, information on there. I guess it's, it's rewarding whatever role. You send a kid, you bring a kid to your family, you're a liaison, you just want to volunteer to drive kids around it's rewarding because you get more intercultural experience than you do in other ways in Humboldt County. Yeah, and I think if you really want to change the world, this is one really good way to do it because you're building bridges among the youth, and I think that that's yeah. going to help shape generations. We sure you know, hope so. People. We sure hope so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in a time when travel is really hard, instead of traveling yourself, you bring the world to you. That's exactly right. Thank you, ladies, very much for coming Thank on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. We'll be right back after this short break. Eureka, California is a place known for its distinguished Victorian houses, but that's not all there is to this town's structural landscape. Look around the different neighborhoods, or even right down your street, and you'll notice an impressive variety of houses that represent notable design eras. Beyond Victorian will take you on a fun tour of the interiors of these hidden architectural gems. on America Outdoors. When you think of wild spaces in America, where does your mind go? I'm on the edge of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. As I take in the scenery around me, I start to see how wilderness isn't just a place. It's a feeling. Last night, Humboldt County government approved what could very well be this century's largest local privately proposed development project. The Planning Commission unanimously voted to permit a Norwegian company to build a $650 million land-based indoor fish farm on the Samoa Peninsula. Nordic Aqua Farms plans to raise and harvest roughly 150,000 daily pounds of Atlantic salmon. Headline Humboldt's Eric Black reports. The company could dump more than 12 million daily gallons of fish wastewater a mile and a half off Humboldt County's shore. Nordic Aqua Farms has committed to voluntary water quality monitoring and reporting beyond what is required in our discharge permit. This was important to the community, but it is also important to us as we are reliant on clean water to successfully operate our business. 
Nordic agreed to evaluate seawater quality before wastewater discharge begins and during initial discharge. That additional monitoring will help state regulators protect seawater quality. But first, the company will spend tens of millions of dollars to clean up the former site of the Louisiana Pacific pulp mill. Which is to remove everything from the site and then do the pre-preparation for the buildings, which was the ground densification, which is to dig up the soil down to the level of the groundwater and then reconstruct um, the, the ground <coughs> at a density and compaction that allows uh, the construction of the buildings at the intensity required. Part of that will enable um, Nordic as part of that work to uh, screen the material and hazardous materials would then be removed. 40% of the farmed fish that we're getting right now is from China. And we're hearing a lot about energy hypocrisy right now. Uh, this would really be the height of food hypocrisy as one of the main consumers of farmed fish to say, no, we want to continue to get that farmed fish from China. We need to take responsibility for our own consumption. It is very clear that this project is a project that we should pursue. In addition to cleaning up a toxic brownfield at no public cost and decreasing dependence on foreign food sources, supporters cite the project's roughly 300 construction jobs and subsequent 150 full-time operations jobs, modernization of the bay's water intake infrastructure that will be used by other aquaculture businesses and public entities, and the emergence of a large electricity customer that could make Humboldt's proposed wind energy project economically viable. The Planning Commission's decision can be appealed to the County Board of Supervisors and State Coastal Commission. Nordic Aqua Farms could begin selling fish by the end of the decade. Eric Black, Headline Humboldt, Eureka. Regardless of whether the development permits issuance is appealed, Nordic must now obtain water intake and discharge permits from the Regional Water Quality Control Board and State Coastal Commission. The Eureka Rescue Mission has been working to remodel its women's shelter, potentially doubling its capacity for a vulnerable segment of Humboldt County's homeless population. Key contributor Ryan Hudson has the story. Harsh winters are especially unforgiving for homeless mothers with children, but Eureka's rescue mission in Old Town hopes to expand its capacity in the next six months, eventually offering more than double the number of beds with an ambitious remodel project in progress in Eureka. We're looking at the inside of a gutted building. It's going to be remodeled and turned into a better facility for local women and children. We're here to talk with Brian Hall, Executive Director of the Eureka Rescue Mission. Hey Brian. Hi. Okay, so tell us what we're doing in this building and, and why is this project important? Well, because there's a waiting list right now for women and children who are on the street find themselves homeless. Um, okay. and that's, that's an ongoing um, problem that we have in our community. It's been that way for a long time. The mission's been here since 1967. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're seeing many more homeless, uh, much more drug addicted people coming to us. And uh, unfortunately, the children suffer, especially um, in those kinds of situations. So uh, we've started this project. It's been in long time planning. Uh, this is phase one, what you're seeing here. Okay. And so this, this area will be um, a small kitchen. Uh, to the corner up there, there will be a, a multi-purpose room. Uh -huh. There will be a boutique. There will be ADA showers and um, restroom facility here. There's uh -huh. uh, going to be a laundry room right behind me, right over here. Okay. And then a part of it actually goes upstairs. So the old staircase has been torn out. There will be a brand new staircase. It'll go up. It'll have a, a landing. And then, and so yeah, it's um, this is going to actually um, this is from here up forward a little bit is where our dormitory will be. But that's a part. That's phase two. Okay. And right now we have enough to take care of phase one, provided we don't have any big change orders. But um, we will be able to utilize the boutique room, the multi-purpose room. Um, temporarily, temporarily until we can move into phase two and three uh -huh. that we'll be able to put bunk beds in and increase our capacity. So right now we actually have a capacity of 34 uh, women and children uh, in, in a given night. Uh -huh. And so when this is completely finished, one, all phases, 
we'll be able to house at least 70 or, or more women and children uh, nightly. Okay. Yeah. And then in terms of funding, um, you've told me that you have what you need for phase one, yes. which would be to do the, the majority of this building here. Yes. Right. Can you tell me what is needed for phase two? We need uh, right around 600000 It'll probably be more because things change. Uh -huh. uh, the inflation and the cost of materials will go higher. Okay. Uh, people can give money. It really helps us a lot. Like I said, 25 bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, or mm -hmm. just a one-time gift. Mm -hmm. um, we, we appreciate anything we can get. Um, but uh, the second phase and the third phase together is about 600000 So we... Um, or more, you know, things uh, increasing cost and inflation and all that stuff. And to get them in here and get them safe and get their lives back together, we, we countless. Our newsletter every um, quarter is chocked full of women and children's stories of being coming here, uh, leaving here, and into permanent housing with mm -hmm. their lives put together. Ladies are coming off the street. Yeah, uh, so they can get out. a change mm -hmm. of clothes, pick out something new. Yeah. yeah, a lot of this comes from our thrift store. Okay. And it's actually sellable. Um, clothing. Yeah. So we bring it in and and, and then this will be kind of reconfigured this downstairs. This will be, yep. And I'm not sure which walls are going to be torn out. There's, some of the rooms are going to be bigger and turned into family rooms. Uh huh. So we'll have singles downstairs in a dormitory and upstairs will be for family, women and children. Yeah. And so we, you know, we've had uh, um, over the years just tons of women and children families come in here um, just with their, you know, fleeing um, being beat up and, yeah. and and coming in here and being able to get their lives together and get safe. Domestic violence Domestic situations. Domestic violence situations. It's a lot of money, but the need is the need. That's the thing is this. This is women and children we're talking about, um, and okay. getting them off the streets into a safe place, uh, away from anybody that would want to harm them. Get them out of the drug culture. Bring them in here where it's nice, safe, uh, good food, um, lots and lots of love. And to get them in here and get them safe and get their lives back together, we'll be able to almost triple capacity of what we are right now. That's great. Yeah. Hopefully won't have any waiting list. Hall says he looks forward to bringing in bunk beds towards the end of phase one, just in time for winter. Reporting for Headline Humboldt, Ryan Hudson. Thanks for joining us this evening. One last thing. Today, the County Public Health Branch confirmed the first case of monkeypox in Humboldt County. Monkeypox is a viral infection which is spread through close personal contact, including skin-to-skin -skin contact, kissing, and sex. The local patient is reportedly doing well, self-isolating at home, and appears to have no close local contacts. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned. Stay informed.